So now, one of the advantages of, of recording is that uh, I'm allowed to do social distance, so I'll take my mask, mask off now. First of all, I want to apologize for not being able to uh, be with you here uh, today. Um, I, I had some uh, previous engagements that, that I couldn't, it couldn't change, couldn't adjust some, some surgeries. So I, I want to talk about two very important things that are, are near and dear to my heart. One of them is uh, uh, opioids and then also personalized medicine, and, and we're, we've been working on these two initiatives, and this was made uh, possible by John DeSanti and the Agate Lab Foundation, as well as uh, Clayton and Linda uh, Wojta. So I'll, I'll start off with the uh, opioids and then shift gears uh, later and talk very uh, briefly about personalized medicine and what we're trying to achieve uh, in this province. So why, why should we care about, about drugs? I think this graph says it all. Uh, if you look from uh, January and December of 2016, we were losing uh, an average of 1.5 people per day uh, due to opioid overdoses. Now with time up to 2018, about 2.2 on average people per day. And then more recently uh, during the COVID pandemic with the increased stress, changes in mental health, we're now at about three people who are dying from opioid overdoses. Uh, each day here in the province of Alberta. One of the other uh, costs of uh, opioids and, and overdoses is uh, economic. Uh, I'm a physician. I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the, uh, the problems associated with opioids in the healthcare system, but uh, we can't discount the effects on, on business and on families. Those are uh, incredibly important uh, as well. So let's look at this table for a little bit. If we, if we uh, Pick the Royal Alexander Hospital in Edmonton. It has approximately 3,000 accounts or, or hospital stays related to opioid uh, uh, addiction and opioid problems. Uh, if you look at the percent that, compare that to what percentage of, of stays, that's 19%. That is a, a massive amount. And we can look at some of the other hospitals across the province. They're a little bit lower, but still a significant proportion of our healthcare dollars and our healthcare our stays and healthcare beds are, um, are related to opioid use. Uh, now, if we compare that to something that is uh, more relevant at this time, we uh, the COVID COVID uh, nineteen pandemic. This is the uh, most recent data from Alberta Health Services. Over on the right hand side, in the in the gray box. During the pandemic, we've had 261 deaths from COVID-19. Uh, the people that are they're dying, dying from this virus, their average age is about 83 years of age. Uh, and this has a, a number of hospital admissions as well. If we compare that to the opioid uh, use or the use of the, of the system, essentially there are uh, double amount of mortalities to opioid. Uh, and if we look at the average age of death, uh, from COVID, the COVID virus versus the opioid, COVID virus, 83 years of age, uh, with opioid overdoses, the average age is approximately 40, so a significant younger population. Another graph, again, this is from Alberta Health Services uh, um, a public uh, website. It's a, a plot of fentanyl and non-fentanyl opioid use. The numbers represents mortality uh, from overdose deaths. Uh, the black ones are, are the uh, summary up above here. Again, going from 2016 and then along uh, the right to 2020. So it was increasing from 2016 to 2018. There's been a big push, and there still continues to be a big push uh, in Alberta Health Services and the government to help prevent this. It did decline. And then again, with stress and changes in mental health, we saw a massive peak in 2020, especially in Q2. We're up to 301 uh, deaths just in that one quarter. And the blue bar represents this is primarily fentanyl. Fentanyl has pushed all the other opioids uh, out of the market, essentially. So how do we, how do we deal with, with this problem? Uh, this slide is, is sort of illustrates that we, we, can't, we can't prevent it. We have to cope with it. Uh, and um, 
figure out a way to educate and, and, and deal with this. So if we look at the profitability of, of drugs, you're able to purchase one kilogram of fentanyl on the internet for approximately 12,000 US dollars. That, that kilogram can then be sold in Canada for around $300,000 with, with a, a similar profit. Now, if you were to take that kilogram of fentanyl and convert it into to pills or to street drug use, it'll make a million counterfeit pills. Now, if you're able to sell each one of those pills for anywhere from $20 to $80, then your profit uh, turns out to be $20 to $80 million. With that kind of a, a return on your investment, you're never going to stop this from happening. And again, we have to cope with it uh, in our healthcare system and through education. So this has been one of, one of our, our goals and our initiatives, again, supported by the uh, Agate uh, Foundation and, and Clayton and Linda. It's opioid education. Up above there, we were able to uh, get into the teachers' convention and uh, help educate the teachers on the dangers of uh, fentanyl and that. Uh, with the pictures down below here, we were uh, able to get into the uh, junior high schools and teach them uh, about the fentanyl crisis and about how potent these uh, individual or these drugs can be. Uh, I work with an undercover a police officer and uh, also an uh, internal medicine doctor who specializes in addiction and, and drugs, uh, and we were able to, to educate these junior high students. It was remarkable to me how little they knew about the potency of these drugs, and I'll give you an example. I've got a 13-year-old daughter who actually attended a, a, a police talk uh, uh, similar to what we were given here, and the amount of knowledge that she brought home and the information she had uh, about these drugs was, uh, was quite remarkable. So our goal with this, uh, with this initiative is to educate our junior high and potentially uh, um, elementary kids in grade six and give them the information and the tools that they need and the opportunity for them to say no, not try these drugs uh, because, because their potency, if they try it once, their chance of, uh, of dying is, is very real. So I really believe we can make a difference through education, um, and, and we're going to uh, endeavor to expand this, um, <coughs> excuse me, moving forward. So I'll, I'll move on to the uh, second initiative, and, and this is a personalized care, uh, personalized cancer care, and I'm going to uh, briefly talk about why I think we can uh, be a world leader here uh, in, in Alberta. This uh, uh, graph looks at the cost of sequencing uh, one human genome. So back before 2000, uh, they spent many billions of dollars to sequence the entire genome uh, uh, of a, a person, essentially. And with time, as technology improved, the cost of this decreased uh, significantly. We're in 2010, we're roughly at $50,000 uh, to sequence one uh, one human genome. Now, if we move towards 2019 and 2020, the cost has now dropped below $1,000. And this is now entering into the area where you can use that in the clinical realm. If you were to sequence a, a, a human at 50000 you can't integrate that into the, uh, the, the clinical environment. It's just too, uh, too costly. So as this is decreasing, we're, we're able now to use this tool in, in the clinical in, environment. As you sequence this and you get these massive amounts of, of data, you can imagine you're sequencing three billion base pairs. Previously, we were unable to uh, uh, analyze all that information. However, with the advent of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and now a, a neural network-based deep learning, we're able to uh, process these massive amounts of uh, information. And again, with that ability, we can bring uh, these uh, into the clinical into the clinical realm. So previously, and what we're using here today in, in my world, in the cancer care world, it's generalized, generalized medicine. So this a group of people here represents a population with, we'll say, to, today prostate cancer. Many of them have variative forms. Some are more aggressive, some are less aggressive. Uh, some have different histologies. And the way we figure out how to treat this, this group is we do what we call a clinical trial. We give one group uh, a, a drug or treat them with surgery and then compare their outcomes. However, within this population, there's many heterogeneous differences in their diseases. So some may benefit from surgery, some may benefit from chemotherapy, and some may benefit more from radiation. If we're able to determine that up front, then we can individually treat that cancer. 
and give the best cancer care to that individual uh, patient uh, uh, moving forward. So that's sort of the concept of personalized medicine. And it incorporates all these things, big data uh, and genomics, molecular medicine. Uh, if, we, if we look at what we need to plug into this, you've got the historical data, the treatment details, all of this gets uh, incorporated through the Alberta or through um, information networks, patient genetics, you'd have to sequence it, the genetics of the cancer is important, and then you also integrate biobanks, molecular imaging, and biomarkers for disease. This all gets uh, linked into these machine learning tools, and again, you can deliver individualized uh, care and the best cancer care uh, to the patient, which obviously helps them and is a cost-effective way of delivering health care. So why, why do you think we can do this here in Alberta and why could we potentially be the best in the world? Well, if we look just at urology, we, we've got two main sites that service approximately 4.2 million people. This is a massive number of patients, all who are in one medical uh, record system, uh, and we're able to look at these really huge uh, populations. All of the pathology tissue is actually stored in this big warehouse, so you can go back retrospectively and look at that, that information and try and figure out which category uh, those patients are, are going to go into and which treatment is going to be best for those patients. We can go back and get the DNA and some of those uh, pathology specimens and, and also uh, figure out again which treatment would be best for them. We do have strong basic science research at the University of Calgary and the University of Alberta. And if we can pull all these things together, I think we can deliver a very effective personalized medicine uh, program. So what we have built uh, to date with the uh, support of the ACF and, and the province is this Alberta Prostate Cancer Research uh, Initiative. We're, we're generating one of the biggest databases on prostate cancer uh, patients in the world. And coupled with that, uh, we're collecting uh, serial blood samples, uh, pathology samples, that we can test uh, their disease. So this is going to be integrated into the whole uh, a program. That's something we're continuing to uh, build on as time moves along here. So we want to develop a clinical and research team that can leverage this Alberta advantage in healthcare. And I think we need to, to further uh, develop that with uh, augmenting basic scientists, clinicians, surgeon, epidemiologist, bio, bioinformaticians, machine learning scientists, uh, and couple that with cooperation from industry and philanthropy. We need to stay on, on top of the technology. You saw from that original graph that things are changing rapidly in terms of just sequencing, but that also applies to uh, uh, other uh, technology and cancer care as, as well. So if we can, you can keep uh, uh, up to date with these technology, I think we're still gonna be able to deliver uh, ideal care uh, to patients uh, and, and Albertans who have cancer. So moving forward, we have built the, the initial infrastructure and we have these established relationships. The technology is changing now. We're able to integrate this into the clinical realm uh, and allow personalized medicine. So that's sequencing and then also machine learning. And we also have the opportunity to recruit a leader in academic research to put this all together in one package. And that uh, is what the Agate Foundation and Clayton and Linda Wojtas have allowed to happen.